We don't follow cunningly devised fables. We have the living word of the living God. I love Bill Wright and Betty. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Numbers chapter 35 and verse number 6. Get that in one hand, Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse 18 the other. Numbers 35 and verse number 6. In Numbers chapter 35 and verse 6, the divine text says, And among the cities which ye shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities of refuge, which ye shall appoint for the manslayer, that he may flee thither, and to them ye shall add forty and two cities. So these are what's called the cities of refuge. Six of them in number. In Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse number 18, the Bible says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner for, his, for us is entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. In the Old Testament, the Lord God showed His graciousness in the fact that He set aside six cities, three on the eastern side of Jordan, three on the western side of Jordan, and running parallel with each other, and called cities of refuge. They had markers on the highways, and the highways were to be kept open and smooth, so that an individual who had to get to one of those cities would not be... Uh, impaired by some problem within the road. And the map or the marker, the signpost, would show him where he needed to go to get to the city of refuge. It was open for that individual to flee to. So why was he fleeing? He had accidentally killed someone in working or something that he had, some uh, thing that befalls people, it happens. And so the avenger of blood, which was given as the law of Moses, that they could take blood payment if one of their loved ones had died. So the avenger of blood was after him, and he could flee into the city of refuge, and once there, he had a sanctuary until he was tried by the people to determine whether or not he was a murderer or that the death was an accident. If the death was accidental, then the individual could stay in that city of refuge. And if that avenger of blood crossed that line, then he would be held accountable before the people until the death of the high priest. And then once the high priest had died, then that individual could leave that city of refuge and go back out into the land to his homeland. And there would be nothing that could be done to him one way or another. Now, if you can't see the type of our Lord Jesus Christ in this, just look a little closer. Because we are guilty of murder, and we are hiding, my dear friend, in Christ. We are protected in Him because He is our refuge. And I want you to understand that when He went to the cross at Calvary, and He died, He paid the sin debt for all of us, every last one of us, bore it in His body on the tree. The Bible said God made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. In him, and it was there at the death of our high priest that we were made free and we could go about free. And we are free today because the Son hath made us free. That's a wonderful truth taken from the Old Testament, but it's a type of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the writer of the book of Hebrews, chapter number six. For he says that we are fleeing or have fled to him as a refuge for the soul. Our Lord Jesus Christ is always available. He's always the same. He's always there. He's always who He is. And He changes not. The Bible says in Timothy that He's the Savior of all men and would have all men to be saved and tasted death 
for every man. I am not a five-point Calvinist. Make no mistake that if you're in this house today, Christ died for you and you can be born again. And he took your sin to the cross at Calvary. And so my friend, when we flee to Christ as our refuge, we flee to the one who is able to do above and beyond all that we could ask or think. He does not make empty promises to us. His word is powerful and his word speaks to our heart. There is nothing that will ever speak to you like the word of the living God. And so a refuge he is. I fled to him in 1973. Carried all my sins to him in 1973. Everything that I was as low down as I could possibly be. And there he received me in to himself. There I have been since that day. Hallelujah to God. These six cities of refuge are named in the Bible. Each one of them have a di distinct meaning as it relates to our Lord Jesus Christ. Quickly I'll go through them. And try to show you today how important they are because they, they bear upon a certain aspect of our relationship with the Lord. God made you a very complex being. When he created you, he created you in the image of God. There's far more to you than you ever knew. There's far more to you that you'll ever know until you've been brought into the presence of the Lord. And the only way that a man will ever understand what he is is as God comes into his life. God comes into a man's life, he begins to reveal to that man what he's made out of, what makes him think, what makes him tick, where he came from and where he's going. Not by comparing yourselves with yourselves. You're not wise. Don't ever let some pagan philosopher try to dictate to you what you are or what makes you think. They don't have a clue. But the Bible has the answer. And in the cities of refuge, you have the answer for your needs. Well, I want you to notice, first of all, Golan. That's what's called the Golan Heights today. The word means revealed or manifested. And so manifestation or revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this world 2,000 years ago. And when he came into this world, God became flesh and dwelt among us. And that was the greatest shock that this earth had ever known. The Bible said in Hebrews 1, let the angels of God worship him. I don't know if you really understand what's going on. But when Christ was manifested in flesh, every demon of hell knew who he was. All the angels knew who he was. When he came, God made himself known. That eternal absolute being that resides in that perfect light has come down to mankind. And he was manifest in the flesh that he might destroy the works of the devil. And that's why he came into this world. And make no mistake about it, he did exactly what he said he would do. So he was manifested. It's a manifestation. It's an understanding, a revelation. You've heard about people that have had an epiphany where they've seen some great light and begin to understand who they are unless you compare yourself with the light of Christ that comes into you by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You'll never know who you are. But the Bible's very clear about it. If you listen to his word, you'll understand what it's all about. In the Song of Solomon, chapter number 1, verse number 5, I'm going to preach through the song this morning and compare this with the cities of refuge. The Song of Solomon, chapter number 1, and verse number 5, the Shulamite says, I am black but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem. As the tents of Kedar is the curtains of Solomon, look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. She understands something about her relationship with Solomon. It's bringing out something about who she is. And that, my friend, is your first step in your relationship with God. Not who you think you are, not who people tell you you are, but who you are. And I don't know who I am until God begins to work in my life. If I'm going to walk with God, if I'm going to have the power of God in my life, I've got to know what I really am. And not live in a, in, in a lie. And most people live a lie. Their whole life is built upon falsehood and fables and lies. And so my dear friend, if you're going to flee to Christ and into a stronghold and a city of refuge, the first thing you're going to learn from God is who you are. And who you are is not who intends to be. Who you are is the starting point for what God intends to do with you in the future. The Apostle Paul said, he that hath begun. Gone a good work in me, will perform it 
till the day of Jesus Christ. He starts something and he will finish what he starts. Amen. So the text says, I am. In Ramoth of Gilead, it means exaltation. It signifies to be lifted up, to be raised up. If you're going to flee for refuge to Christ, he's going to lift you up. He's going to raise you up. Your mind is going to be exalted to where? Preacher, into him, seated at the right hand of the Father with all power and glory and coming might. It's who the Lord Jesus Christ is now that saves your soul on a daily basis. It's who Christ is now that gives you victory in this present evil world. It's who Christ is now that speaks power and victory into your heart. A lot of people to keep him in the manger. You'll see them get all excited in a few days about the manger. They want to keep him in a manger. Some want to keep him on a crucifix. He's not in a manger. He's not on a crucifix. He's the seated Lord God Almighty at the right hand of the Father. That's who he is. I want you to notice in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 2 and verse number 13. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs. The vines with a tender grape give a good smell. And he cries, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Can you hear an invitation? Have you heard the voice of God? Can you hear him as he cries to you? Arise. Come up here where I am. I'm up here in the cloud. Yea, I'm above the clouds. I'm where the air is breathable, where the music is sweet, where the power is real. You need to be raised up from where you are. When God brought that boy that was lame in his feet from Lodibar, what was his name? Mephibosheth, he brought him up out of that pit and brought him up to the king's table and sat him down. It's what God can do for you. That's the key to everything in your relationship with the Lord. It's your understanding of what he has done for you that gives you power in your walk with God. So, Ramoth Gilead, we understand it in this relationship with the Lord as our priest, as the one that we flee to. In Bezer is the third fortified city. It means a fortified city, a fortified place. It's a fortress. This was on the east of Jordan. Bezer. It doesn't mean much to us here in this English world 2,000 years later. But that word carried some meaning to it because it was a, a mount and a place of defense, a fortification. It was a place where when you flee to Christ, you're fortified. There's strength in him. There's power to fend off the devil and the force of hell that comes against the believer. And make no mistake about it, folks. If you don't realize the power arrayed against you, you're living in la-la land. When you walk out of this house right now, you're going to walk out into a world that's demon-possessed. You're going to walk in the midst of principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. They think on an absolutely different level than you do. Their mind is energized by this world and this world system. And how do you do, preacher? You have to flee to him. He's our fortress. He's our high tower. He's our shield. He's our buckler. And the Lord Jesus Christ is everything we need. Not just part of what we need plus something. Not just what we need with this. He's everything we need. In the Song of Solomon, chapter number 6 and verse number 4, we find this. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Terza. Comely as Jerusalem. Terrible as an army with banners. You say, what's that mean, preacher? Go back to chapter number 4 and verse number 16 of the Song of Solomon. Awake, O north wind, and come, thou south. Blow up on my garden that the spices thereof may flow out. <coughs> Let my beloved come into his garden, she says, and eat his pleasant fruits. She gives him an invitation to come into her life, to come and enjoy fellowship and communion with her. She invites him in. So he takes the invitation to heart. Look at the next chapter, verse 1. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spouse. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh, friends. Drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh, beloved. So he answers her request and comes. Most praying is simply, God, give me this. God, do this for me. I need this. I need that. Do this. Do this. Do this. Do this. And when you go to the Lord to pray, that's all he hears out of you. Instead of crying out to him and say, God, my heart's hungry. My soul is thirsty. I know what I need. I need you. 
You give him an invitation, he'll take you at that word and he'll come. He'll come when you invite him. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you, the Bible says. You invite him. He comes. Now note carefully, this is about a fortress. In chapter number five, he's come. Then the scene changes. The Song of Solomon is a little vignette, so a little scene here, scene there. It changes. And in chapter number five, she's in her bed. She's in her bed. She invited him for fellowship, and now time has progressed. And she's in her bed. He comes to the door. He puts his hand at the doorknob. He wants more fellowship. He's coming to her. The voice of God is speaking into her heart. And what happens in chapter number five? She hears him at the door and says, oh my, I'm sleepy. I'm not emotionally touched by spiritual things right now. I just don't feel like it's spiritual today. I'll choose the day, Lord, that we have fellowship and communion. When I feel like I need you, I'll call out to you. I know you'll always be there. You're faithful. Yeah, but you don't understand yourself. Your relationship with the Lord reveals what you're made out of. You don't understand that. You think God is just something that you can pick up and put down and turn on and turn off and call unto and this, that, this, that. He's there for you 24-7. Are you there for him 24-7? It doesn't work that way. And so she arises, her heart smites her, and she realizes, the, 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 she realizes how wonderful a thing she just let slip. And so she jumps up and she runs to the door. And when she gets to the door, he's gone. But she touches something with her hand. It's myrrh. It's memory. It's him. It's his touch. It's his smell. It's his fellowship. It's him. But he's gone. He's teaching her a lesson. She's getting spiritual instruction. He knows exactly what we need and when we need it and how much of it we need. And she opens the door and he's gone. She runs out into the street. Where's my beloved? She cries out to the pagan. They don't know where she is. They have no idea who he is. She seeks in vain. She falls prey to the watchers. They beat her in the street. You can never turn to this world for comfort. You can never turn to this world for instruction. They're nothing but an enemy of Christ. They may be your personal friend, dear friend. But if you have a spiritual need and you think you can turn to this world, you're dead wrong. They have nothing to offer you. But she's about to find her fortress. She'll find him when he finds her. She'll find him... When the time is right, notice what happens. In chapter number 5 and verse number 2, we see this happen. Then in chapter number 6 and verse number 1, Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Where is he? What happened to him? My beloved, she said in verse number 2, has gone down into his garden. She begins to wake up. She begins to go back to her roots. She begins to go back to what makes her tick. She begins to go back to understand what this Christian walk is about. There are things that I should not have to tell you about your relationship with the Lord. If somebody's got a spoon feed you on every step you take with Christ, you don't know him. This walk with God, this fellowship we have with the Lord is an individual, personal, intimate thing. And nobody can interject themselves in there and tell you every move to make. That's arrogance and ignorance. But notice how he receives her. Chapter number 6 and verse number 4. Thou beautiful, my love. One of the keys to understanding the Song of Solomon is, my love is him speaking to you. My beloved is her speaking to him. And so he says, you're beautiful, my love. Oh, I'm a, I marvel at it. I really do. It's that hard, cold, hard heart of ours that takes that gracious mercy of God where he says, I love you. And we use it and we, and, we, and, we, and we manipulate it and we try to make it do what we want. And there's no fellowship in that. He has a real love for you. He said, I love you. Even though you weren't there when I opened the door, when I touched it, you weren't there. 
I planted my garden. You're in my garden. I planted you. You are what you are because I made you what you are. And I'm not through making you what you're going to be. And it wasn't enough. But when she comes to him and realizes he still loves me. He's a gracious God. Does not the love of God and the goodness of God bother you? Does it bother you that, that, that some of you treat God like a dog? <laughs> I mean, that's plain talk, isn't it? <laughs> you treat him like a dog. You wouldn't treat your employer that way. You wouldn't treat your husband or wife that way. You wouldn't be married long. You wouldn't treat your children like that, yet you treat God like a dog. And he's still good. He's still good. You know why he's good? Because he's good. <laughs> He doesn't choose to be good, brother. He's good. The good Lord. He's good. Well, let's move along quickly. Kadesh is another city. This is west of the Jordan. Kadesh means holy. Holy, holy. Holy in the Bible means separate. Separate, separate. Morality is involved. Goodness is involved. Righteousness and ethics and all of these things. That's involved, but that's not the meaning of it. It is a part. A part. Dwelleth in the light which no man can see, which no man hath seen, to whom be honor and glory everlasting. God Almighty is an absolute eternal being that lives in pure light. And it's light that you can't even see. His holiness cannot be violated. So he must come to us. He crosses the bar. He comes to where we are. He makes himself known to us. Canst thou by searching find out God? The Bible screams that at to us. No, we cannot. Can't find him, but he'll find you. And so holiness is that fleeing. I find a place in holiness that gives me comfort. I realize this world is not my home. This is just a temporal thing. I'm here today and I'm gone tomorrow. It's the holiness of God that becomes strength for my soul. I flee for refuge into his holiness. It's important to understand what that means. Look over here in the Song of Solomon, chapter number 6 and verse 1. Whither is thy beloved gone? O thou fairest among women, whither is thy beloved turned aside that we may seek him with thee? So what's that got to do with holiness? It's got everything to do with it. So how do you mean it, preacher? It's this way. You must have something in him that really is real. For you to endure what you have endured out here in the street. When you've been beaten and you've been kicked. And you've been maligned. And yet you still know him and want to find him. I want him too. Is there enough in you to spark someone else's interest in Jesus Christ? Is there enough in you? And the world is so sick to death, folks. Up to here. Well, this fake religion, this plastic smile, this entertainment, mega church, feel good religion, that'll do you no good. Won't do you any good. You ever been in the death chamber? It's not religion they're talking about, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. 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 Is there enough about you? To where somebody wants what you've got. You say, I witness for the Lord. Well, that's good. That's real good. But your life is your witness for the Lord. And preach. Preach. Every one of you, preach. Preach. You're preaching anyway. Preach. And if you have to, use words. They're watching you. Well, I'm not perfect. I don't expect you to be perfect. It's not about you anyway. No. No. Amen. It's about them seeing somebody in you. They know that it's bigger than them, bigger than you. It's Christ being formed in you. That's what draws men to Christ. It's not because of your charisma, your intellect, or because of your achievements and your awards. It's not how great you are. That never draws anybody to the Lord. The Lord draws them to the Lord. Amen. 
I could preach on that one right there from now on because that is the most important thing in your life. If men and women cannot see Christ in you, then all of this babble coming out of your mouth is just so much hot air and empty words. Have you noticed how that certain people put all, put, put their whole Christian life is about what they're saying? You ever notice that? It's all about what they're saying. The whole Christian life, the whole church, the whole ministry. They're talking, talk, talk about what they're saying. But what they don't realize is they're saying something all the time. It's not the words that come out of your mouth. James says, don't be deceived. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer. Deceiving your own selves. I got two more and I'll close. Shechem. What is Shechem? That means the soul, the shoulder. It's somebody that just kind of lifts you up, bears you up, and carries you on. I can't live the Christian life. He's got to live it through me. I can't do it. In Song of Solomon, chapter number 8, and verse number 6, the Shulamite says, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. I want you to notice carefully now, she said, Set me as a seal upon thine heart. In other words, look at me through your heart. Let's walk together and bear me up. And don't see me the way I am, but see me with what you're going to do with me. Amen. Through your heart. It's a seal on your heart. Yeah, the Bible says over there in 1 Timothy, it says, if we deny him, he'll deny us. It says, uh, I can't quote all of this text, but it's just something to the fact that if you deny him, he denies you. If, you, uh, if you're unfaithful, then there, he'll reward you accordingly. But then he said, if we believe not, he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. That believe not has nothing to do with the fact that whether you believe in Christ or not. It has to do with how much faith you're walking in. Maybe just a flicker of faith, just a bare minimum. He said he can't deny himself. He won't deny himself. You belong to him. He's going to uphold you on his shoulder. He's going to take whatever flicker of faith that you've got in this house this morning. Your faith might have been destroyed by circumstances. You've been through a broken marriage. You buried a child. You've had, something's happened. You lost your job. Your health is ruined, destroyed. Everything that life can throw at you, it'll throw at you. And don't believe for a minute that your faith is able to handle anything. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of who? And the faith of Christ is what will do it. And it is just a flicker of it, just a small bit of it. That's all it takes. He'll put you on his shoulder. He cannot deny himself. He cannot turn faith away. He won't turn it off. He won't. He'll turn your pride off and your arrogance off. He'll turn your smart mouth off, but he won't turn your faith off. If it's just a speck, just a speck, pick you up and say, that one's mine, and carry you on. And you'll be surprised at how faith grows from faith to faith. And then the last one is this one, Hebron. You can interpret that as fellowship. It's a land where they brought back the grapes and two men had to carry them. Huge clusters of grapes. Hebron was where David was first anointed as king of Israel. Hebron. That was the land that went to Caleb. He said, I want this mountain. They gave it to Caleb. They gave it Hebron. I've been to Hebron. It's a beautiful thing. You go to Hebron, you look across the rolling hills as far as the eye can see, nothing but grapes hanging everywhere. Hebron. Wine in the Bible is a picture of fellowship. So that's why it pictures fellowship. Hebron. Fellowship. Communion. Walk with the Lord. A sure sign of your spiritual condition is whether you want to walk with God or not. You want to walk with Him or not. So when I need Him, I'll call on Him. He knows all about me. Sure, that's the attitude people have. I don't bother him till I need him. 
Thing is, you need him every breathing moment of your life. Every time your heart ticks, you need him. You need him. But you see, you walk with God according to your felt needs. See, it's worth this churches today, they minister to felt needs. What you think you need. So the preacher designs his message around that and the church ministers to what you think you need. You don't know what you need. I don't know what I need. I need him. And he'll show me what I need. Song of Solomon, chapter number 7 and verse number 10. Fellowship. I am my beloved and his desire is toward me. It says it another way in Psalm chapter number 45, verse 11. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. You say, I'm not beautiful. You're looking in the mirror. Nobody tells me I'm beautiful. You're listening to people. I don't think I'm beautiful. You're talking about the flesh. Have you ever heard the term the beauty of holiness? Holiness. Not made in the image of man, made in the image of God. As he looks in that mirror and sees his own reflection, he wants to be able to look into your face and see his reflection. He wants to see something there that this earth did not produce. He did. And his desire is toward you. Do you realize that the church of God is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ? These terms, bride of Christ and body of Christ, are not Old Testament terms. Nobody had any concept of that until the Apostle Paul started preaching it. That we're the body of Christ, that we're the bride of Christ, and that his desire above the queens and the concubines and all the rest of them is toward us. Do you realize that he has a relationship with you he didn't have with anybody else? He doesn't want it with anybody else. Amen. He's got it with you. Amen. That's why the Bible said, let a bishop, bishop be the husband of one wife. One wife. Solomon was an abomination. 700 wives, 300 concubines. David had wives and concubines scattered everywhere. It was not so, Matthew 19, from the beginning. One man, one woman. The bride is the reflection of that man. Every man left his own body ought to love your wife as you love yourself. He didn't tell you to love yourself. He said, you do love yourself. No man ever hated his own flesh. That's what it says. The bride, therefore, you look at her and think, my, she's beautiful. She's beautiful because she's the gift of God. The Lord Jesus Christ looks at you and says, I paid for you at the cross. You're my bride. There's not another like you. You're the only one. You are it. The Song of Solomon is a love story. The Song of Solomon has terminology in it that is kind of embarrassing to get up in the pulpit and read. Honestly. Anybody that's read through the Song of Solomon, there's some places in there, they get kind of touchy. I'm not trying to condemn the Word of God. I'm just saying the Word of God just spells it out. You want reality? Open the Bible. But the Song of Solomon is a love story. Even though she failed time and time and time again, he came back to her. He came back to her. He came back to her. And he said, I love you. He said, you're the desire of my eyes. Literally, you make my heart skip a beat. That's how much he loves us. Do we love him like that? Why don't we love him like that? Is it all about what he can do for you? Your felt needs? Or is it about the presence of God in your life and in your soul? When he begins to manifest to you holiness in your life, in your soul, shows you a void and he fills it, shows you a place you need help and he helps it, shows you weakness and he becomes your strength, shows you how lost you are and he becomes your savior. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. Do you want that? You know how close it is? You realize how close it is? How close? How close? Draw nigh to him. 
He'll draw nigh to you. Amen. Not a bunch of intellectual babble, That's right. but from the heart. Amen. I don't have a desire to do that, preacher. Ask him to give you a desire. Right. My faith shattered and shaken, preacher. It's about finished. Ask him to give you faith. God made him to become to us everything we need is the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, in thy name we pray. Use what I've said for the glory of God. There may be somebody in this house this morning who's hungry, Lord. They're hungry. They're not hungry for, they're, they're tired. They've had experiences, and the experience didn't last. They've had emotional ups, but the emotional ups always end and they go down. They've had everything the world can pump into them, everything religion can handle them, but it hasn't, hasn't satisfied their soul. They're still hungry. In Jesus' name we pray. And for Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen. What do we got, brother? Page 383 in your All-American. Let's come. thing he's coming back right. and I told the Sunday school class you may not know this folks but Israel has already said now Iran's got about 30 days that they're going to have a nuclear weapon and Israel has said plainly they will not stand for is for Iran having a nuclear weapon what's that mean that means that they'll strike them militarily if what they say is not a bluff what they say is facts and true and they're gonna to stand to it, they will strike Iran. What they're probably trying to do right now is to get Obama to support them. Whether he will or not, I don't know. But the bottom line is that if this takes place within 30 days, folks, there's gonna be a war yeah. over there in the Middle East. And it's not gonna be rebels out here running from house to house shooting at you with machine guns. It's gonna be a major power against a major power. It's going to be an air force against an air force, a navy against a navy, armies against armies. And it could easily drag in other countries and could explode into World War III. Yeah, that's right. And if World War III explodes, folks, somebody want to make a peace agreement with Israel. That's right. He's called the Antichrist, the man of right. sin. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It won't be wonderful to see war and all these people being blown up over there. It grieves my soul the way they're murdering people. But it would I would rejoice to see Christ come again. Yeah. Hallelujah to God. Amen. That's the only hope we got, folks. That's the answer. <laughs> Sing one more verse. appreciate you listening to me. I appreciate it very much. I'll give you this one thing before you leave. Did you know that over a hundred admirals and generals have been purged from the United States Army and Navy in the last few months? It reminds you of the purging that took place under Stalin. You don't hear a whole lot about this. I'm talking about admirals and generals, folks, general officers, 
been purged, forced to retire, forced out of the U.S. military. That's quite an ominous sign. Something's going on. Amen. God bless you. Let's pray, brother. Brother Caldwell, dismiss us, please.